All right, um, it's one o'clock and uh, we will uh, kick off our webinar on uh, GDPR and marketing. And um, as some of you may know, this is the third uh, webinar that we are hosting at Inside Venture Partners. Uh, and it is we've had the first one that focused more from the legal and compliance standpoint. The second one focused on our IT uh, issues and we had AWS present during that and today we're really going to focus on marketers and and to some extent as well sales and um, it, as you can tell um, yes it matters to us means you know from my discussions at, in our marketing center of excellence I've found that there's quite a large number of companies that either are early in coming up with strategies to deal with GDPR or may not have even started. And uh, for those reasons, we thought it was important um, that we had that discussion. Um, the first thing I just want to start about is just a little legal disclaimer, which basically is that um, this presentation on GDPR is provided for information purposes only. And webinar attendees should not construe the contents of this presentation or any discussion about the subject matter of this presentation as legal advice. We, invert, uh, we urge any of our attendees to seek legal counsel for assistance on the specifics of the GDPR and the impact to your organization. Um, a little bit about our agenda today, we're going to do some brief introductions and then uh, we will have our friends at Serious Decisions give an overview of GDPR and uh, the compliance plan and then our friends at Salesforce will be discussing some very specific marketing concerns and then we will end with a Q&A period. Um, just uh, a quick introduction, myself, I am uh, Gary Service. I'm a venture partner and head the Marketing Center of Excellence here at Insight Venture Partners. Uh, we are uh, pleased to have Julian Archer from Serious Decisions as a Senior Research Director. And we have as well uh, from Salesforce, Mickey Chandler, who's a Principal Privacy and Delivery Deliverability Compliance. A few quick rules of the road. Uh, the first one, which is just uh, a little uh, talking about the legal issues here. We're not going to be giving advice today. Um, we are going to be trying to explain the extent of the issues that are out there. Um, the need for advice, we will tell you, is pretty deep. And so, you know, in many cases, if questions come out that are advice oriented, um, the way we will answer them will be primarily to guide you in the direction of where to find that information. We will, in some cases, be able to give you some uh, pieces of information which will be useful, but we will steer away from giving you specific advice. And the second part, um, which is just a little bit about the context, is this is a very uh, expansive piece of regulation with many particular facets, and everyone should recognize that we, it will be a little bit frustrating because we won't be able to get deep enough into any areas to really um, understand all the pieces. We've tried to give you some ideas, a little bit about process, and, and a little bit about direction as you, as you proceed forward. And, and hopefully that will get you on the right path to start um, dealing with this GDPR issue. Um, I start out with this uh, particular image about marketers head in the sand only based on conversations that I've had as well as some of my colleagues, which is basically said, you know, people may know it, know GDPR, they may understand it is an EU regulation, but um, they don't recognize as American companies, especially that there are some fairly large impacts on how they market going forward, especially if they are going, if they have offices in the EU, or even if they don't have offices in the EU, they will need to understand what the implications are here. And, um, you know, the other part about this is, is that when it comes to this, I said that there were three seminar uh, webinars that we did. One was on, on legal, one was on IT. Truth of the matter is that marketing is on the front line of this. They are dealing with 
folks' privacy and communications at every level. They're trying to, modern marketing demands quite a bit of automation. And again, there are issues around that that GDPR deals with. So um, if this is your wake up call, hopefully you will be taking your head out of the sand and paying attention. Um, just a little bit, uh, just some really basic pieces here, just to set the table here on GDPR. The first one is about um, the issue of privacy and the fact that privacy is really the focus here of this particular uh, regulation. The, this replaces what was the, called the um, protection directive. And what is important here is the, there was very little about privacy that was across the EU. Each country had their own sort of way of dealing with it. The GDPR really is um, meant to bring together an EU perspective here. Um, time is ticking. Um, enforcement begins in at the end of May 2018. Um, it was passed in uh, April of 2016 to give everyone enough time to uh, pay attention and make changes, although some organizations are still catching up at this point. And as I mentioned, American companies really do need to pay attention. Um, this is, does not apply just to EU organizations, but to any company that is processing and holding personal data of uh, any what they call data subjects residing in the EU, regardless of your company's location. Um, that is what is important here. And lastly, um, if, it, if this hasn't got your attention, the fines that are around this should, should get your attention. It can be as high as 20 million euros uh, or 4% of your gross worldwide sales, whichever is greater. So again, the EU has put some real teeth in terms of what the actual dollars and hurt will be to organizations that don't follow, follow these particular rules. Lastly, I just wanted to mention a few of the key terms which we'll be hearing today. Um, one of them is about personal data, and I'm, I will tell you that the, the definition of personal data from this particular regulation is, is pretty all-encompassing. Um, if you think you can skirt around it by saying that this isn't uh, personally identifiable in information, um, you probably are mistaken. Um, most of the information that marketers collect is personal data at some level. The next one is about processing. And I think that, you know, we all sort of understand that we take the data that we get and we do something with it. This sort of set of operations that is performed on this is a key area for marketers to pay attention to because we all process the data. And what we do with that data is, is again, specifically spelled out within the GDPR in an area which we need to be focusing on. And lastly is this concept of profiling. So if, if, if processing the data is taking the data and at some level changing um, what it is profiling is actually utilizing that data to create profiles of particular people, whether they be customers or prospects. And again, the regulations around profiling and a lot of what comes from modern marketing tools involves profiling. It involves using IP addresses. It involves a lot of different um, pieces of the puzzle that you as a marketer rely upon that you're going to need to consider going forward. So with that, oh, and one last thing. Yes, we will be sharing the slides and the audio recording of this. And um, I want to, at this point, um, pass over to our friends at Serious Decisions so that they can uh, begin discussing their perspective on GDPR. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Gary. This is Julian Archer speaking from Serious Decisions based in the Netherlands. Um, so excuse me for my wonderful funny accent, but there you go. So um, I want to emphasize and, and re uh, uh, support some of the things Gary's been saying, that this is a, a law, it's a European-wide law we're going to be talking about now. So it's not just an individual country by country. That's the beauty of the GDPR. It's now across the entire EU. I think it's also important to, to, to comment, it's not just about email or email opt-in, it is indeed about the processing of personal data. And so what I want to do, if, if the slides work, I think they do work now, if I'm pushing forward. So I'm going to talk to you today about some of the key tenets 
that of the GDPR that affect the marketing and sales functions. As Gary's been saying, you've been hearing a lot about the IT folks and the lawyers and the and the business uh, binding corporate rules and the and the data breaches and all really important stuff. But too often, it seems that marketing is considered this black box. And, oh, we'll get to marketing later. What we at Serious Decisions do is focus purely on the marketing team and the sales team because there's a huge, huge impact because we are processing personal data consistently. Now, we're talking about GDPR today. Uh, if it's going to, and what we're seeing, I, I want to just, just, just take one step back. And of course, right in the middle, you see the red, the European GDPR. But this is a map. Of all of some of the privacy regulations going around the globe because yes other countries have privacy laws as well now they're not as strict as the GDPR but look at Canada look at Mexico look at China look at Australia look at Argentina they're all very very strict regulations other countries have less strict regulations the US being a classic example yes they're very very hot on date on data breaches but when it comes to personal privacy um, that's very very much an opt-out you can do what you like until I say stop type of approach so there are there is a difference this is a very a change of attitude required as marketers to understand the full impact of GDPR so yes it's important to be compliant for GDPR 25th of May true but think also if you're a global company how are you embracing everything around privacy across all your markets as well and you may find that focusing on GDPR helps you be compliant in all countries around the globe and um, Gary was talking about the fines and we can talk about the fines as we move forward but I, I just want to spend a couple of minutes saying look yes there is a big stick they are really enormous fines but we are talking to so many clients who are taking this very seriously and are seeing this as a catalyst for change, a catalyst for improved marketing. So yeah, let's say we have a tick in the box, yet we're going to be compliant. But think about the benefits in terms of a better, cleaner prospect database. Think about the fact what we can do now with a more holistic view of our contacts. All of a sudden, we are have more confidence in our data because we have this consent, we have this understanding of who we're talking to. So we can do better targeting, we have better analytics, we can actually move forward and up the pyramid to this idea of genuine interactions. Why am I worried about how many contacts are not opening my emails if they couldn't care less about me? Let's think about having positive, good marketing, knowing where the source of our data is, knowing where it's stored, knowing that the type of focus and relevance we can be to those prospects and to those customers. We actually do see many organizations, as I say, using GDPR as a force for good, if you like, better data, better insight, and actually probably cheaper, because I'm sure you're paying for the storage of that rubbish data you've got in your database systems now. Um, maybe you should clean it and just say, do I really need that data? Do I truly need it? What, what value is that data to me? It's bringing me risk. I can't use it. It's cluttering up everything, everything I'm doing. Let's have a better approach around data governance and data regulation. So that's what I want to just make, make sure. So I will talk about then now, you know, yeah, the fines, and that's really important, but let's not lose um, uh, touch with the idea of having better marketing as well. So I'm going to bring out some of the key tenants now. Not all of them, there are many, many more, which I, I, in my time I can't cover today. But I wanted to cover a couple of key tenants. And the really important thing is the European Commission is not introducing GDPR as a business prevention rule. It's not aimed at the B2B marketing functions of organizations. It's aimed at the privacy for the compliant capture and usage and processing of personal data in the EU. So it actually it affects the HR function in the EU. It affects business to consumer. It affects everybody or it affects children. Now in, in B2B, we don't, we, we're not concerned with children, but the GDPR does have something to say around children. But from our point of view, in the B2B world, we have to be clear as an organization under which lawful basis are we processing data. Now, there are six here listed. I'm going to spend some time today on the consent and legitimate interest. Not to say that the others aren't important. They are. But as a B2B function, these are the ones we're, we're heavily involved with. So just think to yourself, ask your lawyers, ask yourself, under which lawful basis are we processing the data? If we can give a positive, affirmative answer to say, yep, we're doing it under consent, we have the consent, then everything else flows from that. Everything, all the good marketing you're doing, that can continue. If you have decided to use consent and you have consent, then there's no problem. So these six are the key things to ask yourselves. Where are we and what basis are we processing the data? Now let's move forward to, to some of the key things. Now, in case you don't know, this is the flag of the European Union. Now, we're talking a lot about, let's say, personal data. Now, as, as Gary was saying, 
actually the definition of personal data changes wherever you are. I think it's just interesting to see, just, just as a bit of a, a background here, all the various countries and what they have as the definition of personal data. If you look at the top left in the US, you have this definition that says information that on its own can reasonably, now that word reasonably is a very Anglo-Saxon word. If you ask a German if to, to, to define reasonably, they say, no, you can't define reasonably. But the point being, the US has on its own. Now compare and contrast that with the bottom left flag, which is the European Union flag. It says any information that can directly or indirectly identify somebody. So actually, I'm a serious, I'm a serious decisions senior analyst based in the Netherlands. You know what? Senior research director, Netherlands, serious decisions. That you wouldn't think, well, actually, that's probably not very personal. Well, that's, that's actually, but three together, there's only one of those people in the world, and that's me. So actually, indirectly, those three, those, those three data fields would identify me. So it becomes from anonymous to, per, to, to, to personal. So the, I, I, I brought out a, a new chart for you here, which I'm, I, I want to share with you a chart which shows you the, the, the breadth of the understanding of the, or the breadth of the, the elements that make up personal data. And I know in the US you have this expression called personal identifiable information, which is a very small subset. So my recommendation to you is do not use the word or the term PII if you're relating to the GDPR, because it's a very small subset. It's very cute, it's very nice, but it's nowhere near as expansive as the European data de uh, definition. So yes, in the physical ID, of course, we all have physical ID. We have a phone number, a mobile, that type of thing. We have a digital ID, the email address. But as Gary was saying, the digital address also covers IP address as well, or cookies. And I should point out that on the 25th of May next year, as well as GDPR, there's a new regulation called e-privacy coming out. Now, that's the, that's the due date. We're hearing it may be slightly delayed. I don't know. But e-privacy e is a law touching on cookies and in-mail and all those sorts of things as well. So be aware that it's not just GDPR isn't the last thing you're going to hear about. There'll be e-privacy as well coming down the track. But think also about the metadata, the location, the search history. And then you as an organization may decide, because of the requirement to gain and capture consent and be more interactive and more relevant with your clients, I'm going to start expanding and investing in preference management centers. And so therefore, you may collect preference data from me as a subscriber throughout my, my relationship with you. But altogether, we have to think about why are we collecting this data, what data we are collecting, and are we being transparent and upfront um, with the data subject as to why we're capturing it, the fact of capturing the data, and how we intend to use that data. If we can say to the authorities or to ourselves, we've been clear, we've been concise, we've been unambiguous, we've been very, very open, and we can, and we can show and prove these times of consent or legitimate interest, then we're on a, we're on a very, very good path. So this is a really good slide, especially for US audiences, to understand the full breadth of what we mean by personal data. It's probably a far more advanced than you've been thinking up until now. So let's move forward, because I think there are other things. I think, yes, look, we've got the no home. It's, you know, there is, as Gary said, there's no distinction between B2C and B2B. It affects all EU residents. Um, yes, if you are processing data of an EU resident, then you are affected by this law. I don't care where your headquarters is, I don't care where you're based, if you are processing data, say my data, because I'm an EU resident, then you are affected by this law. I think also this, this expression privacy by default, which we should concentrate on as well, because it's not about, I'm going to find you, I'm going to just be checking like a policeman every day. We as organizations, we as pro controllers and processors have to build in to our processes, to our manufacturing, to our solutions, to our systems, to our IT, privacy by default. Everything we do, we have to assume that we haven't got permission until we've actually been given the permission. We have to assume that we're going out for privacy. Now, so that's great. And then I know there's, there's a biggie for yourselves in the what is consent? Because if you're choosing consent as the lawful basis of communication, just be aware that consent has to be unambiguous, purpose-linked. And, to, and, and there, we can talk about something, I've got the definition of what we mean by consent there. Uh, excuse me, I'm gonna go back one, I think. That's the problem there, okay. Um, we get, yeah, so here's the consent. Consent should be given by a clear affirmative act, establishing a freely given and is specific. So what that means is, the empty checkbox. You need to make sure that you've got, you know, you haven't uh, pre-opted, preempted me in or, or, or opted me in. I have to have said, said something or given a sign where it's clear and concise and specific. Yes, I'm letting you not only 
email me marketing communications, but also process my data, for example. If I don't respond or you pre-ticked it, then that's not consent. And it can't be hidden in the middle of a privacy statement halfway down the page saying, oh, well, we treat your privacy uh, um, with, with, with respect. No, no, no. It's got to be clear, unambiguous, in your face. It's got to be really, really upfront there, okay? Now, many of us know that in Germany we have this thing called double opt-in. Actually, GDPR makes no mention, to my knowledge, of the double opt-in process. But the bad news for you guys is that Germany law today doesn't make mention of it. It's just the point being, the level of proof required means that I cannot be allowed to put your email address and opt you in. So that's why the double opt-in process is there. And so that will continue. And for many, many customers I'm speaking to are adopting the double opt-in process across not only Europe, but some are doing it across the globe, even in the U.S., they're asking for consent because this is the way the world is going. And it's less risky, it's safe, it's secure. You can't always be sure, is an EU resident in, in my account record in, for example, a US company? So that's where many companies are saying, oh, and by the way, Canada has opt-in as well. So many companies are going by consent as, as, as a default. So that's good. Now, we to put this, the next one I want to talk about is this thing called legitimate interest. This is where we have to prove that, that it is in the legitimate interest of the data subject that they receive information from us. Now, we cannot, this is not a silver bullet. This is not a get out of jail free card. Again, I'm not a lawyer, but for all the lawyers I've spoken to, they say, no, we should not be using this thinking that we can always just send things out as we want to. This is main, mainly around, can we prove that there is an interest? For example, if there was a data breach, it's in your interest that I let you know. I haven't got, I haven't got your consent to, convert, to, mail, to mail you, but it's in your interest that I'm doing it. It's not, or it's in my interest to sell more stuff, therefore I'm letting you know. But you know, there are, there, it, is, it, it is a gray zone. There are things and there are things we could possibly be doing. I'm thinking here about, for example, where we think about this, that interests, legitimate interests could exist, says the European Commission, where there's a relevant and appropriate relationship between the subject and the controller. For example, where the client is in the service of the controller. So that could well be helping in the area of customer marketing. But it means if you have solution X, yes, I'm, I'm able to tell you about solution X plus Y, but I can't tell you about something completely different, A, B, C. So it is a gray zone. We're waiting for more interpretation on this one. But please do not use it as a get out of jail free card, all right? So there are some key things there. And finally, I want to talk about two more things. You've all heard about the prospect rights, the right to erasure, et cetera. But I want to focus on the middle one, this demonstrable proof. If you can be clear and concise and have documented guidelines and processes, and you can show training records, and you can show that you're doing things, half the battle is showing the authorities or your own legal counsel that we have got good privacy policies, privacy processes in place, and they're being adhered to. That's what's really, really important. And Gary mentioned the penalties, so I won't dwell on those. Yes, they are pretty, pretty stiff penalties. So that's really important. So we are serious though. So, okay, look, we know that the lawyers are going to be there because, you know, it's not only the controllers. It is the MAP providers and the, and, and the CRM providers. They are equally on the hook. So the commission is looking not only saying, oh, well, the controllers are important. Yeah, the processes, what are you doing? How, what, are you, or what are you doing to be compliant, for example? You can no longer say, I'm just the platform. What are you actually doing processes to help us? I'm really, I'm really, really, really glad that Salesforce are on the call today. So, but we are serious. Say, okay, now we need to help marketers get our arm around this. And so I won't go into too much detail. I'm very happy to speak to all of you after the event and have fix, fix up some further calls um, with our serious decisions account managers. But we've tr produced this compliance model as a marketer and sales team to get our, our arms around this whole area of and making sure that we are looking at our data from an entire life cycle perspective and making sure we are compliant and build compliance into our processes. So the top I'm showing you the corporate data policy. Every organization needs to have a corporate data policy where the CEO and all those in the, in the C-level suite are bought into this. GDPR is not the responsibility of the field marketing manager in Liechtenstein. This has to be a corporate policy. Everybody's responsible in terms of gaining consent and driving compliance. Sales folks have to make sure that they are also making sure when they communicate, they are compliant. The bottom, the bottom layer, I've got people, technology, and measurement. Think about what you're doing to train people, the certification. Technology. Technology is a 
exploding the number of types of technology that we that we're able to use and there's something fun, there's some really truly great systems in terms of consent management in terms of preference management in terms of data tracking really really great technology but don't think that technology alone is going to solve the problems your processes have to be compliant as well and measurement start measuring your openness and your relevance and your and your your level of compliance start measuring how many opt-ins do i have as a percentage of my database now actually start measuring it set yourself targets and, and look every week every month at how far you're getting along but in the middle the key one is looking at the intake of data how are we making sure that compliant data is coming into our systems how about the storage of it now maybe in marketing you're not going to be heavily involved in the storage maybe you are but we've seen a great trend in recent years where marketing functions go out to market and be, uh, become the responsible function for marketing applications and they take on the responsibility that has until now been done by IT maybe not the MAP or the CRM system but maybe an event management system hey that contains personal data so you have you on the hook there if you are responsible think about how that data is stored the middle one is how are you making sure that your systems your processes your campaigns your tactics are using compliant data and then the maintenance of that data. What processes have you got in place to maintain that data? Maybe gain consent renewal because the, the, the consent has expired or was specific and the change and there's been a change and therefore the consent is no longer valid. And think also about how you will delete data. Too often we hear a company who say, well, no, I'm, I, I store it. Yeah, it's mine. I may need it in the future. You're storing data now. You may have to be forced to delete that data by a request, or you may determine that the, 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 the right to, to store has, been, has expired, or you may think, you know what? It's too much of a risk. I don't want to, I want to delete this data. So I've got great examples here, which I can share with you at a different time, how to think about all of these four things here. So we have a model. We have to think about, you know, from intake to storage. And I want to go through how we would set about implementing this process, because, you know, intake, what about the consent? Not only on the web forms, but in the, in the trade shows. How will you cap capture consent to trade shows? That's why the double opt-in process is so good, because you can be speaking to somebody and then send a compliant a double opt-in mail after the event, for example. So there are some many great things we can do about this. And what I want to do is, is, is go through with you, assuming that this model is, being, you know, is covering things which, which it certainly does. We need to think about how we can go forward and implement this model to cover the whole data lifecycle from intake through to deletion. So we see the marketing team has to have a seat at the table. They may or may not be the catalyst. They may be the leader. They may have a data privacy officer who they're reporting to. I don't know, but there has to be a compliance program team. And this has to uh, relate to and get information from, on the top right here, the legal counsel. Absolutely, um, Gary was saying, make sure we're all legally you know, aware. There'll be external agencies. What is your MAP provider, your CRM provider, your event system? What are they doing? What, what, what contracts have they got? What are they doing to make sure that the compliance process is built into their own technology? And again, work with your risk office. The top left, of course, is really vital. The executive sponsors, as I said, you, this has to be done from the C-suite down. Finance. If you're going to be facing risks of 4%, I've got a great example of a client of ours who said, I'm the head of global marketing operations. I do not want to go to my board of directors and say, I need 4% of worldwide revenues to pay a fine. So they're absolutely telling finance, we need to do this to make sure we continue good, the good business we're doing. So get their buy-in because it's not just about, as I say, the marketing teams in, in Europe. Then build your team. Make sure as marketers you're in that team working with IT, making sure you're working with the sales and marketing operations, making sure you're working with HR because you need to train people and educate people, not only, not only today, but from now on until we, ever, until we retire. Think about onboarding, etc. And then find out, work with the stakeholders who can provide you a lot of information about where you're, where you're, you know, what you're currently doing and where the gaps are. And to that, to that end, we've, we, we've built out a... a, a um, a compliance uh, implementation framework, which you're looking at now. Oh, I went one too far. Excuse me for that. I thought I had. I'll, I'll just go back. What you're looking at now is based on the, that compliance model. How do we go about, what are the checkpoints, the checklists we have to do to implement that model? Now, what you're looking at is rather a lot, and you can imagine there are slide decks and worksheets behind each of this implementation framework. So let me just build it out for you, and let me explain to you what you're looking at. What you're looking at is seven phases of implementing compliant procedures. Starting in the blue, which is more 
preparatory education defining order and i'll come to those in, in, in more detail in, in a minute but then the green is actually planning the processes building out the processes and actually beginning to uh, to, to adopt them and make sure that they're fit for purpose and the final phase is looking at the operation because again as i said it's not just on day you know day one 25th of may we're all compliant yay fantastic no, no no you have to operate from now onwards forever and ever and ever so these phases help us, and each phase has certain objectives. It has certain participants who we believe should be pay taking part. There are inputs into that phase, stuff that has to be done, the tasks that need to be done, and the deliverables. And so what this is looking at in the educate phase is really an understanding by jurisdiction, whether it's European Union or Japan or Canada, what are we doing in terms of understanding what we are, what, what, what the requirements are? And everybody has to be aware of that, but maybe legal are, are helping us a great deal there. So we need that input from, as I said, the technology vendors, from the, from the legal guys. And we need to have an understanding that we are confident that we have a, a good base of understanding around, around the laws. And so we actually need, therefore, at the end of this phase, a documented legal view and the implications of what it means for the sales and the marketing function. Then we have to decide as a company, what's our risk profile? Many times companies, and I, I, can, I, I give probably four or five uh, analyst inquiries every day on this subject, and I can tell you there's a wide range of folks who say, we will always be 100% compliant on the one end of the scale, right to the other end of the scale, where some are saying, yeah, well, maybe we will, maybe we won't, I don't know, we're very small. You have to define your risk profile. That's up to you. It's, that's, that's not me to decide. I would always err on the, on the more cautious, so I think it's very, very good marketing practice. But you need to have a definition of what it means, what these laws mean for you as a company. So you need to understand the corporate goals. You need to understand the impact analysis in terms of investment. What will you invest, et cetera. And so therefore, you have to understand the impact and the threat and the opportunity. Hey, if we could get this right, because then all of a sudden we've got better data, better focus, that's better than our competitors because they're not doing anything about it, then great, that's an opportunity for you guys as well. So at the end of this defined phase, you're looking at a compliance strategy, a value versus cost analysis, and a functional strategy, the marketing function, the sales function. Maybe you have an inside sales function which is separate. What does it mean for those folks as well? So you understand where the position is, you know where you want to go to, and of course, the next phase, the audit phase, is really breaking out where are we today. We need to do our assessments. We need to understand, for example, um, what in terms of our, our, our content is, what our capture processes are, what our legal verbiage is that we're using, are we being consistent across every European country, et cetera, et cetera. We are identifying the gaps between where we are today and where we need to be. So at the end of this phase, the end of the audit phase, we have a gap analysis, we have an exposure analysis, and we have an assessment of our processes, not just the number of opt-ins we have or whatever or number of clients we can use legitimate interest with, but what are our processes? Let's, let's, let's assess our process. How fit for purpose are they? And so therefore, we've got a great position by the end of the audit phase where we are. The green phase is where the rubber hits the road. This is where we start planning and building out the compliant processes and start prioritizing where we actually need to invest time and money more quickly or less quickly. What can be delayed? What, can be, what has to be done now? And that means that in the plan phase, we need to look about project plans. We start building out budgets the staffing models, if we need to change that, for example, and getting the executive buy-off to that investment and to that process change. It has to become from the top. But then we've got the plan, now we need to do the building in terms of physically putting down this type of project will cost X amount, it will take this number of weeks, it will change the process. For example, we currently, maybe you currently get lists, um, you, you, you attend a trade show, and you get the list of attendees, and you upload it, that could be a process you have in place today. That won't work if you go into GDPR, because actually you're uploading uh, data which you do not have the right to have. You may have, maybe you have got the right, maybe the event organizer has enlisted you as a sponsor and they've given consent, great. We have to have a process in place that makes the list upload, for example, compliant and secure, or accept, or at least tweaking it so make sure you can then go after the fact and, and use that data um, in a compliant way. That's just one example of the type of thing you have to build into your process and build a project plan and who in, who's involved with it to actually make it work. 
And then you have to adopt it. Yeah, one trade show is not enough. It's every trade show from now on or every consent form or every salesperson who's entering a manually a manual enter contact record. What are you going to be doing? If they enter a contact record, are you going to be making sure you get the, st or get the source of that data? You may decide, I'm going to send that new contact a compliance mail like in the double opt-in that could be happening as well if you're there at a trade show and you say hey put your business card in for a fishbowl to win an ipad okay i've given you my business card to win an ipad i haven't given you permission to email me for the next 10 years of my life things have to change in process and understanding of what consent means and this is where this green phase where actually change where that change that dramatic dna change actually takes part and the final phase is the operate phase as I say, you have to have the demonstrable proof. That is such an important expression. Can you prove what you're doing? When was the opt-in gained? When was the double opt-in gained? Is that there? Are there, are there timestamps in your CRM and your data um, and your MAP systems, for example? Think about that and think about being ready to receive or produce audits and produce reports for external authorities. Anybody may come and ask you to delete the data. Can you do it quickly? How quickly can you respond? So we have here a framework which we believe is, is, you know, as I said, I can go into far more detail on each of these phases, but in the time I've been given, that's going to be impossible. But I thought it was just good to show you that type of uh, that, 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 uh, framework which we help our clients with, okay? And so I want to move forward to some other things. That what the, to the pitfalls, be careful. That framework works, but there are things you have to be careful about as an organization as you begin and move along your journey. In the education phase, you cannot assume, like you, I just showed you at the beginning there, the difference between the definitions of personal data. Therefore, folks, you cannot assume that your understanding of personal data is the correct one. If it's PII, it's not good enough, for example. Maybe also a failure we see all the time is not enough time and money being given and spent on these compliance activities. It's going to cost money, but I say not only is the benefit going to be in, yes, being compliant, avoiding the risk of 4% of worldwide revenues, the real benefit, though, is actually being able to be better marketers. I, I, I've got an analogy for you. Many, when I was a young lad, they introduced seatbelt laws into cars. You know, before, when I was very, very young, we could drive in a car without a seatbelt on. And then they said, nope, you've got to wear a seatbelt. The point being, you know, hey, God, that, that's a bit restrictive. You're saying I have to wear a seatbelt. And yeah, that's the law. You wear a seatbelt. Buckle up. The reality is, though, if you fast forward to now, 2017, you don't hear many people being fined for not wearing a seatbelt. And as, as an individual, with, especially if you had family, could you imagine driving in a car and not wearing a seatbelt? It's so second nature. It makes such good sense that everybody's doing it. And so that's an analogy which I think is really important. You can say, I, I don't want to wear a seatbelt. Why wouldn't you wear a seatbelt? What's, the, what's to stop you? And I think that's where we're going as a, as a society, as companies. We're moving down to this idea of making sure we are changing, we are being compliant. So that requires that we are, and as a company, in the defined phase, we do have an understanding of what the law is, and we understand the strategy. We're, we're putting some time and effort into really understanding what it means to change the DNA of our organization, especially our marketing sales teams. In the audit phase, it's not just marketing. I really can't stress enough. If you look at the amount of data that sales folks capture, the significant proportion of money they make in terms of revenue, in terms of global revenue, they're dealing with tons of data as well. So they have to be involved. In all functions need to be involved. And what we also see in that audit phase, I'll give you a classic example. Think about the crossover between marketing and sales. If you're having an MAP system or you're having a, a, you know, emails and someone's unsubscribed, yes, Marketing may not send them an email from their MAP system, but that means also, I'm sorry, that teleservices shouldn't be sending them an email email because whilst you and I may know the difference between a marketer and a teleservice, the external data subject, all they've been told is they, should, they, don't, they don't want to receive any more marketing emails. So what's your process to, to move from marketing to sales to make sure that they also adhere to the right processes and to the conditions that have been laid out? When it comes to the, the planning phase, look, We've got time, yes, you've had 18 months up until now, and then you've got six months left. Do I believe, this is my own personal opinion, I'm not a lawyer, that on the 28th of May, the sky will fall down? I don't believe that, but we are on a journey together. We need to make sure we are really embracing this. So do make pilot, make sure you're gonna be happy at events or on your web forms. Don't go for the, just a big bang approach on day one. 
Think also about what you're doing to make sure that the data you have currently is being reconsented, for example, or rechecked because you can't be doing any grandfathering. Think also about the actual way you're tracking the data. Think about all those types of things and the dependencies of that data. If, for example, if you would have anonymous data and then all of a sudden now you're bringing more, more extra fields in, that makes it personal. Think about those, those, those dependencies. Think also now, if you think about it, we're talking about privacy regulations and there will be an authority if we fail. But internally, you have to think about our escalation procedures for yourself. If you've built out all these great processes to drive compliance, what is it, your, what's your process if you're not going to have that, you know, if, you, um, if someone fails or doesn't abide by the rules internally? I'm thinking about here of certification. We regularly, see, or we will see, I'm sure, changes to people's terms of in, in, um, um, employment. But I also think you need to have an escalation process that where something is not working, yeah, someone has the authority to say, no, we must change this process. I mentioned technology, really great stuff is coming out, the great, some great technology, and I could talk to you a long time about that. But I also think it's wrong to say technology alone is gonna solve us, uh, save us. We need to be building into our processes, compliant processes, supported by technology. And so, so make sure your process is there first and the technology will support it. I think it's important that we, uh, in the adopt phase, it's education, 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 not only for the people who are there, but the new hires as well. And make sure, let's say, that, 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 that onboarding is there. Now, what we're telling you today, maybe the interpretation of the laws will change. As I said, e-privacy is going to come in very soon as well. And there may be another regulation in, in Region X coming down this path in 2019. I don't know. But we need to make sure we as a company are keeping track of these, keeping pace of these. All right, so and also be aware if you enter into new markets, um, understand what their regulations are. And that's why I think though, I think the GDPR, this whole concept of are we being upfront, clear, concise, unambiguous in our intent and purpose for why we're collecting this data. If we are, we're certainly halfway there. So, so think, think, think about that, okay? Um, I don't make sure. Yeah. So as I leave you, I'm gonna talk about the, so some clear takeaways. This is, a clear, you need, this is, affects everybody. It's not just the Europeans. It affects everybody in the organization if you're doing business in Europe, okay? Make sure you're looking for the accountability for the privacy across all functions. It's not just marketing's job to capture the consent, for example. We've got, oh, I've got examples of clients where the sales are out there capturing consent. I've got organizations where sales are ahead of marketing in demanding GDPR compliance, which is unusual, but I do have examples there, okay? Invest the time to complete the full audit. I mean, this is where GDPR is so good. It's actually saying to us, marketers, you must know where your data is, where it's come from, where it's stored, and why you've got it. Is that such a bad thing that we as marketers shouldn't know that? I mean, we should know that as marketers. So make sure you put time into that audit so you actually know where the data comes from, where it flows to, and what the quality of that data is as well. Prioritize your compliance gaps. You can't do it all at once. You need to focus in your, your attention. There will be some areas that are obviously bigger than others. Make sure that you are blocking or not letting, un, you know, contaminated data coming into your systems um, that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're busy working on, the, on, on one end of the spectrum and dirty data is coming in the other end of the spectrum. Make sure you're being identified with all these gaps and you're prioritizing them as well. I, I can't stress enough, the compliance is a, it's a DNA change. It has to be part of the culture. It has to come from the top. It cannot be, oh, well, if we can get away with it, then we'll be all right. You may decide that as a risk, as, as a business risk, then be, be polite and upfront and uh, open, but that's your particular position. Do not rely or hope that the European field person is gonna sort of say, well, I'm gonna, I'll just try it, I'll be all right. I'm, I'm just gonna brush it under, un, under the carpet. You need to have a consistent policy. And you also need to make sure that you're tracking these regulations, as I said, because they, they, they will be changing, all right? So, I want to thank you for your time. I think I kept in time for my, uh, for my time. If, I'm sure there's some questions at the end. I'm only too happy to answer them. So, Gary, with that, back to yourself. Thank you so much, Julian. Appreciate um, your perspective here. And um, now I'd like to introduce Mickey Chandler of Salesforce, uh, a principal there, um, privacy and deliverability compliance. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. 
So I've been asked to cover some specific marketing tactics. This will, um, there we go. Um, this will of course start with the ubiquitous uh, legal disclaimer that while, uh, while I'm going to be talking about the GDPR, this is not intended to be legal advice and uh, we urge you to consult with your own legal counsel to uh, familiarize yourself with the GDPR's requirements as that may uh, govern your specific uh, situation. And so I am starting off well by flipping forward several slides. Uh, really the first thing that we want to do is talk about having a data plan. You want to start by having the right information for the right reasons. So uh, talk about what do you need in order to accomplish the task that's at hand. That's really a lot of what GDPR is about, is making certain that you've got the information that you need, but that you don't have information that you don't necessarily need. Uh, so what do you have and why do you need it? Is it, uh, in, in the slide that, uh, you know, that, that we had up a while ago, there was a, a great point there that, that Julian had in, in some sort of ancillary stuff he, that highlighted the, the phrase watering holes. Does it really matter to you uh, sort of which watering holes your, uh, your customers like to frequent? That might make, a, that might make for good uh, decision-making interest if we're going to take them out to dinner, but is it something that we necessarily need to track? Uh, what are we going to do with that data? So. What do we need? Why do we need it? Make certain that when you're making marketing decisions that those are the foremost, con uh, those are the foremost questions in your mind. What do, we, what do we need in order to accomplish the task and why do we need it? And if we can't answer those questions, well, first of all, we might need to rethink our marketing, but especially if we can't answer the question of why do I need it, then we may need to rethink why we're going to collect it at all. Uh, for a long time, it seems that a lot of folks have tried to sort of uh, hang their hat on the idea that, well, we don't need it today, but we might need it later. And the whole concept of might possibly need something later is one that kind of needs to get set to the wayside. You also need to figure out accessibility. That is, uh, you're going to get requests to review information. Uh, I build a lot of those requests today uh, for the company that I work for. Um, and end up having to forward most of them over to our privacy uh, attorneys. But when someone gets a request to review, uh, can they answer it? Is it, you know, is this something that a salesperson is going to be allowed to do? Are they going to be allowed to, to show someone uh, what data has been collected on them? Are they going to be uh, someone who is uh, properly set up in order to uh, correct that data? Uh, do your salespeople know who those people are and how will they handle those requests? Because if you're not going to authorize them to, uh, to review the data or to let the person review the data with them, uh, really only the polite thing to do is to point them in the right direction and say, this is the, this is the person you need to talk to in order to see what we have and, and then they can help you make any changes that may need to happen as a result. You also want to look at sunsetting data. So this is something that I think Julian talked about a, a bit, but it's something that we need to talk about as well, sort of in the context of marketing tactics. And that is, if I collect something today, will I need it tomorrow? Will I need it in six months? And so I need to have a plan in place that says I'm going to review what I'm holding and make Take appropriate steps, take appropriate steps based upon what I have and what I need now as opposed to what I thought I might need six months ago. So it might be that uh, you thought that having a record of your, uh, your prospect's favorite watering hole was a good idea because it would help you in these respects. But now a year later, uh, you go back and you review things and you say, you know, that hasn't ended up being as helpful as we thought. There were uh, other reasons, uh, group sizes, whatever, that meant that we're just not using that data. So what do you do with that data? 
reflexively, I'm going to tell you that probably the answer here needs to be, if you're not using it and you don't think you need it anymore, then you probably need to get rid of it. Uh, Julian was, was mentioning, you know, there's a risk that's involved. And while I'm certainly not going to tell you what the risks are, I'm going to tell you that anytime you hear someone say there's a risk involved, then maybe you need to rethink what's going on if you don't need that data anymore. So how long do you need it? Uh, and how can you get rid of it? So, you know, what are we going to need to do in order to get rid of the data? Uh, and, and understand for a lot of folks, this is turning into, you know, the question that we get quite often is, how do we get rid of the data from the system and any backups? And so it's not just a question of, you know, can we get rid of it from the frontline system? But if we need to restore something, are we going to restore in data that we told someone that we had deleted? And so, you know, who can get rid of it? And, and that really involves not only you, but that also involves your partners as well. There we go. So for, for instance, we have a, a, an innovation journey that we're currently in, involved in. This sort of lays out sort of what we've been doing. We have more than 200 people across engineering, product manage, management, strategy, and legal who've been working on our strategy for GDPR. Today, uh, our products meet a majority of the requirements and we're validating our roadmap enhancements with uh, customers today. And so that's really sort of that, uh, that yellow session there, or section there. That's where we are in our roadmap today. And then we're hoping to uh, have further enhance, enhancements to what we're doing uh, before the spring of 18. And then of course, moving forward, as we continue to review things and new guidance becomes available, we'll have additional GDPR related releases that occur. But when you're dealing with your own vendors and you, know, you may be the data controller, but your vendors like your email service provider, they're going to be data processors. And so you need to be talking with them about what they're doing so that you know what's going to happen with the data that they have that you're giving them some control over. So how are they processing it? What processes do they have in place to assist you uh, if someone asks to review the data that you have? Or if someone asks you uh, to uh, allow them to exercise what people keep referring to as the right to be forgotten. How are you going to handle that where you're not just dealing with data that you're that's in your own, for lack of a better term, physical control, but as well as, as the what we'd refer to as the constructive control that you have because it's in someone else's system because you put it there and you're asking them to do something with it. What are you, you know, what are you doing in order to get with those folks and talk to them about what's going on and what your expectations are for how that hand for how that data will be handled in certain specific instances where you know something's going to happen. Uh, sort of touching again on, on things that uh, Julian was talking about, for most of us, a big area of compliance concern is going to be opt-in standards. And so uh, sort of talking about those again, you wanna make certain that that consent is something that's extended and not assumed. And so uh, Julian very rightly pointed out the, the idea of the pre-checked checkbox. Uh, when you check that box, what you're saying is, I'm assuming that you're going to give me consent until you tell me that you're not by unchecking the box. And what we want to do when we're dealing with areas of consent is make certain that uh, that permission is something that is extended by the data subject, and it's not assumed by me. I also want to make certain that the opt-in that I get is specific to what I'm wanting to do and how I'm going to handle it, and not just sort of generic. One of the things in my job in dealing with what we refer to as deliverability compliance, I deal with a lot of spam complaints, and I have a lot of customers who will tell us something along the lines of, well, opt-in was given to this other person 
And in their privacy policy, it said, and we'll share your data with all of our value, uh, all of our valued marketing partners. And we're one of their marketing partners. That, that would be, at best, that would be considered very generic opt-in. But what we're looking for here and what you're hearing even from folks like Julian on this webinar is that opt-in or that consent needs to be something that is very specific in nature and not generic. And it needs to be requested. Uh, that is to say, I can't require that you do this in order for us to complete the transaction. So something that we will see sometimes is, yeah, in order to order from us, we require that all people opt into our, our newsletter. And that's really not what we're looking for in this specific instance. What we're looking for is where I make a request and then you have the ability to say no, rather than me saying this is required in order for you to do business with me. If I'm requiring it, then it's really not consent, it's more of a mandate. And then also, as Julian mentioned as well, it needs to be upfront. That is to say, I need to ask you for consent, you need to extend that consent to me, and it needs to be specific in nature. But it needs to be up front. That is to say, again, as Julian did, this is not something that we want to see hidden in your privacy statement because that's really not what people are looking for. There are a couple of pitfall, uh, pitfalls here. Uh, one is IP address tracking. Uh, people talk about IP address tracking a lot. And here in the United States, we don't tend really to think of that as being specifically personally identifiable information. That is to say, um, you know, I, at home I have a, uh, I, I've got a cable internet connection and uh, that uses DHCP, which means that every once in a while it phones home and potentially gets a new IP address. So it could be that the IP address I have today isn't the one that I have tomorrow. And because of that, we tend to think that something like an IP address isn't personally identifiable. Uh, sort of on the other side of that though, we've got this statement from the uh, office or from the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK. Uh, however, the GDPR's definition is more detailed and makes it clear that information such as an online identifier, for example, an IP address, can be personal data. So that means that there's a pitfall here if we continue to think sort of as we do here in the United States when it comes to privacy issues that are touching these folks in Europe. So an IP address, while we may not think of that as being personally identifiable, can at least in certain contexts be considered personally identifiable information in the EU, which means that it has to be treated sort of differently. It's not, it's not anonymous data anymore, rather it's very personal and specific. So this sort of goes back to, uh, again, the example that Julian gave earlier, where you can take some three different aspects, right? He, he's a senior analyst, he works for this company and he lives in this place. And any one of those three may not be personally identifiable, but when you combine those together, as he said, there's only one of those in the world. Well, the same thing might also be true of, of your IP address. When you take that, especially in combination with other bits of information, that may be specific enough in order to say that consent is needed here as opposed to just assuming that IP address tracking is okay out of the box and in all circumstances. Uh, the other one uh, that I was asked to, to talk about briefly but specifically is the idea of, of targeting or profiling. Uh, there's not a whole lot that I can say here without crossing lines into giving legal advice, but what I can, what I think I can say is that if you talk to your attorney uh, in dealing with GDPR questions about Article 22, which talks about an automated individual decision making, including profiling, uh, which talks about that, then you're probably going to find that there are some things that you may not have thought applied to you, but which may. Uh, generally speaking, people have the right not to be subject to a decision that's based solely on automated processing. 
without certain exceptions, and, and there are three of those, but really the exception that will apply in most instances is again consent, which is why targeting and profiling is on this particular slide. So what that means is in a lot of cases, if you're doing targeting or profiling, this needs to be an area where you're getting consent from the person that you're going to potentially be targeting or profiling. In other words, they need to know what you're doing and how you're going to go about it. And they need to tell you that it's okay for you to do that. One area that I think we sort of leave behind in a lot of this is the fact that marketers try all kinds of tactics and they work in all kinds of different areas. And when something doesn't work, they move on to the next thing. Uh, sort of the problem with this that I see in, in my work life where I'm dealing with questions of consent where it comes to, uh, for instance, our anti-spam policy, is that sometimes that means no one knows how or, or when consent was extended or, or what the terms of that consent were. Uh, and so I, I mentioned versioning. What you want to do, I think, is link language used in order to get consent with the data subject rec uh, record. And so you could either put the consent statement in the record or, or it could be a field in the record where you've got a master that says, this is how we've asked for consent in the, in the past and entry six or you know entry six A or, or whatever you want to call it uh, is what we're going to put in the data subjects field so that we know which one of these forms of uh, request for consent was what they actually agreed to. Uh, the reason for that, and as I said, this is something that I confront a lot when dealing with anti-spam policy, is that you want to be able to show what this person agreed to when you get questioned about it. And so I will sometimes get questions that I don't remember signing up for this, but if I can go back and I can take that language, I can take that language and show them, well, this is exactly what you said you were agreeing to when you signed up with us. The same thing is going to be true in a lot of these instances where you're dealing with questions of consent under the GDPR. You're going to want to be able to show someone this is exactly what they said they were agreeing to, and this is how we're complying with it. And so I think versioning is something that's pretty important. It's something that a lot of people tend not to think about too extensively, but keep a track of the versions and then as you're tracking what those versions are, instead of just putting it in a pile and saying, this is the stuff that worked and this is the stuff that didn't work, you also have the opportunity then to say, not only is this in the pile of stuff that didn't work, but there were these people who agreed to it anyway, and we are maintaining their consent under that standard. And so if someone asks the question, I can show them exactly what they agreed to. And then you also want to engage in periodic review. So as I mentioned a while ago, if some bit of data isn't useful any longer, I think you want to delete that and document it. And so something, again, that Julian was talking about a while ago is a need of documentation. It, just about anything that I do, I document. Uh, just about anything I think that you do uh, within the realm of privacy is something that I think you need to document. So in other words, you may want to be able to say, we used to keep this data but then we determined that it was no longer useful for us to know where our prospects' favorite watering holes were. And so we removed those records from all of our prospects' data. And so that used to exist, but it doesn't any longer. And we deleted it on this date. If something does become useful, then obviously you want to add it, but you again want to document it so that you know when that policy went into effect and you know who is subject to the collection of that data. And then if someone isn't a customer any longer, then you want obviously to delete them and document that as well. This is going to be, I think, an area where a lot of people end up having some problems. And the reason I, I think that is, again, something that I see in my work dealing with our anti-spam policy is that people want to periodically go back and mail people who used to be customers but aren't anymore. Uh, not only speaking, uh, speaking professionally, not only do those people tend not to have actually given permission to continue to mail after they've ceased being a customer, but more importantly, they no longer have an expectation of receiving messages from you. Now, when they cease that expectation, they're going to start complaining about that mail. 
And when people are mad enough to complain, that's when they're going to be mad enough, especially under, under a regime like the GDPR, to start asking questions about what data do you have on me and can I review that and offer corrections to it. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we were talking in, the, in sort of the first slide that I was mentioning or, or that I presented in that first slide, we talked about what data do you need and why do you need it? And the fact of the matter is, if they're no longer customer, I may no longer need that data. And so my suggestion would be uh, to delete that and again, to document it and, and to say, you know, on this date, we looked at people who hadn't been customers in the last two years. And after a follow-up to see if there's any interest, we deleted them from our database. Um, you also want to look at data accessibility. So generally speaking, your CRM should make it easy even for your overworked salesperson to show your customer what, um, you know, what preferences are set and should even make it easy for them to edit those preferences on the fly. And it, it's a record in the database. And so any, just about any CRM, you should be able to pull that up quickly and easily. Uh, I think uh, for Salesforce, this is something that our salespeople, I think, should be able to do using our app. And so they should be able to show something and say, this is, you know, if the question comes up and says, well, can you show me what you have on me? Then if it's within policy, and I'm not sure what our policy is on, on that area, but if it's within policy, then they can say, sure, this is what this is what we've got. But if it's easy for an overworked CEO, if it's easy for an overworked salesperson to show that and edit that, then that should make it even easier for someone with training in the area. If you say, you know, this is something that needs to go to our data protection officer, or this is something that needs to be reviewed by legal when these requests come in, if it's something that even an overworked salesperson who's got to make 50 calls today, if it's something even that they can do, then someone with good training and who knows what they're about, it should be super simple for them to get to the data and provide the data that the person's asking for. Uh, and here as well, uh, I put preference center pages can give freedom. And sort of what I'm going for here is the idea that uh, in a lot of instances, you don't really need to have someone come in and say, can you show me what you have? I want to look at it and potentially edit it or offer corrections to it. Uh, so with something like a, a uh, with something like a preference center, what you can do is offer them the ability to do that without necessarily needing to contact you for that purpose. And so you could say, this is what we have. You can edit your data here. These are the preferences that we see that you've set, and you can edit those here as well. A and you could sort of move forward from, from that. And then again, you want to sunset data. I think probably the biggest thing here is the idea that you need to make it as easy to get off of a list as it was to get on. If someone has, if you can get on very easily, then you also want to make it really easy to get off. You want to give them options, but make one of those options to remove me from everything. And then you want to work with your data processors. Um, such as your vendors, your email service provider, et cetera, to remove deleted data from their systems as well. And remember that some data uh, may be necessary to keep even if someone asks for everything to be deleted. So uh, sort of the one area that I, I sort of think about this most often is someone says, I want you to delete everything that you have on me and never contact me again. I want you to put me on your opt-out list and now I've got a request to delete everything and to add them to an opt-out list. Uh, you know, so which of those do I do? And the answer, you know, is probably delete everything I can, but I need to keep the record of that opt-out request so that I make certain we don't contact them again in the future. And with that, I've come to the end of my slides. Uh, so I will turn it back over to Gary. Thank you very much, Mickey. Um, I wanted to just encourage anyone that had questions to feel free to utilize the, the interface here from GoToWebinar to ask those questions, and we do have a few there. Um, but before we start there, a question just for the both of you, which is, if you are in a situation where your organization really hasn't started yet getting ready for GDPR, um, 
where do you start? What is the best way to jumpstart your organization in terms of getting yourself prepared? Uh, yeah, okay, for me, and I'll, um, and I'll certainly let oh, go ahead, go ahead, Mickey, go ahead. answer yeah, go ahead. probably more comprehensively, but for me, the very first place to start, I think, is by getting uh, buy-in from the C-suite. In other words, just because you have realized that you haven't done anything yet and you've got a long way to go, the fact of the matter is that especially at this point in the game, it's going to take a lot of people working together, and that's going to take resource allocations and basically commandments that are coming for the very highest levels. And so if you haven't even started yet, the first thing I would do is get executive buy-in. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, I mean, along those lines, I mean, you need absolutely to be able to prove that you're, as a company, you're taking data privacy seriously. You need to have some documented proof that this is a policy and you maybe have that buy-in and then produce a, a report or a, a guidelines or a plan of what you intend to do along with those implementation frameworks I said so that's the that's the strategic level moving forward so that has to be done in parallel what you can also be doing is then build out per function okay what does it mean for you sales for marketing so actually you know it, you cannot just rely on marketing to do this by themselves sales have to do it and then so that's sort of like mid mid level if you like and then down at the tactical level you have to begin to bring together an understanding of what you're currently doing in terms of your data sources. We, we, we recommend what we call a port of entry analysis, where you're looking at how is data coming into your systems? What, is the, what do the web forms look like? What's your event policy? So understand how data comes in. And then the final, you know, sort of the, the, the absolute bottom layer is understanding, getting your arms around what data do we currently have today? In that, in that respect, I'd even break that down. It's like, like a massive elephant, like 1.6 million contacts or whatever it is, okay? Break that down into, let me understand how complete are each of my contact records? Let me define completeness. Can I, am I just storing a record which has got some silly number in there, and I'm calling that a contact record, right the way through to a really comprehensively complete contact record in my persona area, in my sub, in my sub industry where I'm really focusing on. So you break the data down into the completeness of the contact record and when was the last time I actually engaged with that person. And if you didn't engage with them for the 36 months and it's an incomplete record, then delete it. But if it's, if it's right, good, good, solid, you know, good quality, complete data, and also in your sweet spot, then start grandfathering, start driving programs to absolutely get that consent and opt in. And you can, there are many ways we can do that, and we can talk about that afterwards, but yeah. Okay. So there are four, four layers. Absolutely, you get the corporate guys, C-suite, you are taking this seriously. Then functionally, making sure they're engaged. Then looking at the overall area, what you're doing right now. How are you gaining consent? How are you gaining compliance now? And then literally look where you are and then drive actions to, to build out that compliant database. Okay, great. Um, someone um, asked a question and said, as it's not okay to use broad, nonspecific consent requests, does that mean yeah. they have to use pop-ups like for cookies in Europe today for everything now, remarketing, Google Analytics, et cetera? No. I, I'll, I'll take that one first, and Mickey, can, um, no is the answer there. The, the, this consent has to be specific, and it's not only about email. I've seen, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I've seen legal wording saying, I consent to receive marketing communication and to the processing of my market, uh, of, of my personal data. And so I've seen that. So that's, it, it sounds sort of broad, but it's not It's specific in terms of understanding yeah, marketing communications um, and, and processing of data. I think so that's okay. But when it comes to the cookie consent, that will be covered by the e-privacy regulation coming out. But you're right. If I'm based in Europe now, if I went onto the IBM website or Oracle website, I physically cannot use their website until I've accepted cookies. So I find that, you know, it, it, because if I have that consent, then what I'm doing then is being able to use my marketing and my, my, my normal retargeting um, as per normal, okay? So you, you, you don't need pop-ups like that. You need to think about upfront getting their cookie consent, understand the preferences there, and also having that sort of wording that lawyers will allow that, that lets you process their personal data. 
Mickey, did you have something you wanted to add? No, I think uh, I think he covered everything that I'd want to say. Okay. Um, so one of the questions was that someone said, several of my company's systems claim the system cannot delete data, <clears throat> but can flag it for deactivation or flag it as disabled. Is this deactivation considered compliant with GDPR? I hate to say it, but that sounds so situation intensive that my best advice is you should consult your attorney. My my advice will be there. Look, you, I think you mentioned it before, though, Mickey. If somebody says I want to opt out, you you're allowed within commission to store that data so that you can actually re, um, um, service that request. I. I don't want to receive any communication. So that that is actually, from what I've ever, for everything I've read, is is deemed acceptable. Yeah. Um, so you, I think you mentioned it well before. What do you want? Do you want me to delete everything, or do you want to have or, or un, unsubscribe? So I think that that's where I'm seeing many companies are saying no. I'm able to, you know, put their record in an unmarketable field. That actually tag is unmarketable. You know, it's 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 there. Other companies are going down the idea of encryption where they're using encryption keys and they're giving the key to a third party um but you know, deletion is is in different layers do you mean do you mean unreachable do you mean uh, encrypted um, or do you mean physically absolutely gone and by the way not only on your map systems and crm systems but think about your storage policy and deletion policy for excel spreadsheets or the laptops of salespeople or usb sticks that has to be covered as well in guidelines okay um one of our uh, our listeners here said, can consent be coupled with a marketing offer or does it need to be a standalone message? I think Mickey had it right. When it, when it comes to uh, consent cannot be, uh, um, service cannot be given subject to consent. Having said that, let's define service. If it's a contract or, you know, your, your, buying something that's different than for example i have a wonderful piece of content here which i'm happy to give you free in exchange for the consent so most companies i'm seeing are differentiating between a white paper for example uh, where i'm giving you that it's it, it, it's not a service i'm just have i have something of value for you and in return i want consent as opposed to you know i'm going to use your software and own uh, or what you know it's it, it's 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 a service I would also stress, though, if I am actually offering or buying a service, maybe then the lawful basis for communication is then contractual. Yeah, I'm a customer. I'm actually, I, maybe I'm not even paying for it. I, it's, it's, it's a quasi-contract. But then the, the lawful basis is, is contractual rather than consent or legitimate interest. So, and, and just to be clear, so then it's okay for me to buy people's consent too so if i want to give Ooh, my dollar whoa, 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 whoa. I, I i know what you mean i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm just putting this out uh, a five dollar starbucks gift card for you to consent to be marketed to is that okay but would you do that what's the value in that because i can unsubscribe the next minute why would i do that well people give people all the time uh, get offers in order to be added to email lists so you know get a 10 percent discount and, and, and i would yeah. as a marketer i would strongly recommend is that honestly how you want to be spending your marketing dollars buying the, for the five dollar gas card the reality is you should be so focused and relevant that that people want to engage with you after this call look at the oracle subscribers uh, preference center for example they're putting out their content that's value by persona to the ceo to the cfo i want to engage with you if you're having to buy my loyalty it's not really loyalty and it, it doesn't it's it, it's i just say i can as mickey quite rightly said to unsubscribe has to be as easy as gaining consent so therefore you i could literally get the five dollar gas card and unsubscribe the next second then you just wasted your marketing money that's just poor marketing i would say great um i asked that question because someone literally asked that to me so i thought it was a good one for the group to hear um another one is for services that leverage ip address lookup for personalization of content how would a user opt in and is the service provider um and 
that's probably not the right term here, but um, uh, responsible for collecting opt-in or the vendor leveraging that service on their website. Is that clear? Mickey, do you want to answer that? Sort of. Mickey, do you want to answer that first or not? Uh, no, I'll, I'll happily uh, yeah. defer okay. to your thoughts on that. I think when, when it comes to IP, again, I come back to the basic principle. What are we being clear and upfront about what the data we're, we're capturing? And that's why, I mean, maybe for your U.S. audience, you, you, you haven't seen, I'm based in Europe, I am European. So literally when I go to websites, I see, you know, we use cookies and I have to accept them. If I don't accept them, then, then the cookies should not be dropped. And then you say to other clients, I say Oracle, IBM, I literally, I cannot get on their website. They're using folks like um, TrustArc and that sort of stuff to, to actually make me, you know, actually accept cookies. Now, honestly, the barrier to me accepting a cookie is far, la far less than me having to check a box and say I consent, for example. Because honestly, if I've gone to the IBM website, I'm, I'm, go I'm going to just accept it. It's, it's easy. But then from that moment onwards, all the IP targeting, all the pop-ups, that's going to be completely legitimate. Yeah. So the the idea, though, uh, what you mentioned, a secondary question there was around the the controller and the and the processors. There's a huge uh, debate going on now because obviously it's the processes are equally liable. So the contractual changes in between the controller and the processes are being really rigorously reviewed now by the lawyers because you cannot just pass on responsibility, but you also have to make sure that you're covered. So the idea of third-party data purchase, for example, I mean, that, the idea of, well, we have the third-party opt-in, that's, that's gone. It, it doesn't exist. If, if as, a, as a Frenchman, as a German, as a Dutchman, right now, I tell you, the, the idea of buying lists is, is almost like, what? Are you still buying lists? Um, you know, you have to remember that Germany and Holland and Sweden, they've got opt-in laws for, since 2003. So this is not that new for them. The question is, you have to decide is, are we going to take this seriously? And I think the 4% worldwide revenue fees is what's making people take this whole area seriously. Um, so I, I hope that's answered the question anyway. Yep. Um, this question is for Mickey, and it is, do you have any examples of innovative ways uh, Salesforce customers have used Salesforce to track privacy compliance issues? And does Salesforce um, offer an advisory service or um, coaching on this? Well, I, I guess we need to break that down into two parts. Uh, the, let me answer the second one first. To my knowledge, we don't offer uh, a services consulting package that would deal with GDPR compliance. A uh, big part of the reason for that is a big part of the reason why I'm on this uh, webinar instead of one of our privacy attorneys. Uh, we try to be very careful about not giving customers what amounts to legal advice. And so uh, you, you'll notice, despite the fact we started the, the webinar with the statement about how this isn't legal advice, my section also had to start with something similar. Uh, the And so that provides, I think, a big part of the answer if we were to give you advice about something and that advice were to be wrong, uh, obviously, you know, th that would potentially put us on the hook for some things that we're not exactly prepared to be on the hook for. And so to my knowledge, we don't offer that. Um, the first part of the question is interesting, and I don't know what any of our customers are doing when it comes to um, creating their own solutions for GDPR compliance. And so it makes it really hard for me to say that anyone has done anything particularly insightful or innovative when it comes to that. Um, and yeah. even for what we're doing internally, it, I have to say it all seems to be pretty much by the book, which is to say we're leaning very, very heavily on our attorneys to tell us you know, what they think that the various articles of the GDPR and, and all, what is it, 170 something recitals, uh, what they mean for our business and potentially for the businesses of our customers. And then we're talking about how we can take that knowledge and then leverage it either, either in our platform or for our own use as we're also trying to comply with the GDPR. 
but I don't feel like that's necessarily innovative. That's just a pretty by the book strategy, which is, you know, this is a very legal intensive issue. And so you go to your lawyers and you lean on them. I would, I would add to that if, if I could Gary, just, just one thing, because and the, just the nature of the business that Sirius do, I mean, because I, I, I fully agree with Mickey, I, we are not lawyers, but what, what Sirius can do, what we've done all the time is because we are speaking to so many clients, as I said, four or five inquiries a day, they are working with their lawyers. And so we've got great examples from our customers and we have forums and roundtables. And so we can share how everybody else is doing. For example, driving a compliance program, looking at the trade shows, looking at how compliance is being driven by sales and marketing and teller. Um, so those things are, I, I, I can't say, for example, the verbiage on the, on the wording, on the opt-in. I can't give you that, but I can certainly tell you and show you what other companies are doing. So in that respect, there are some great examples out there of people thinking about this as, you know, the, the sky is falling down. Oh, my goodness, what do I do? But the reality is there's some really pretty innovative things out there which are completely compliant and just good marketing practice as well. Makes sense. Um, last question here. Um, how about um, the impact that this regulation will have on data append services that augment records in a CRM system? Will you be able to use them? My question, my answer to that, I don't make it, I mean, if you have the consent for somebody, then that's going to be okay because what you're saying that you've the, the, the data subject has given consent to have personal data stored and processed. If you haven't got the consent, then you ask yourself, well, no, because then 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 basically you haven't got that consent. So as long as the consent is broad enough in terms of marketing services, as it was some of the language you use, then then potentially it would be possible for you then to use the data at pen because it would be possible. And I bet again, back to Mickey's point, this yeah. is where you go to your lawyers and you Absolutely. don't say, Mr. Lawyer, or Mrs. Lawyer, what's the law? You say, we intend to do this and this. Is that acceptable? And they're going to give you an answer. Yeah. I've, I've, had, I've, I've got many, many clients who their lawyers have said, look, we as a company, legal counsel, this is acceptable. We could defend this. If we've documented it and we've got process guidelines in place, we as a lawyer's firm for this company are prepared to accept that. Now, maybe your lawyers have a different interpretation. That's why it's important to, to have this process in, you know, documented. You get the green light from the lawyers and then you're good. So it's not, it's not right that Julian says that or serious. It's, you know, you've, that's the way to approach the whole pro uh, problem. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I, I can, I, I completely agree. The only thing I would add to that is, uh, sometimes it's good to also uh, consult existing contracts. So I, I know, for instance, yeah, good point. Uh, here at yeah. the marketing cloud, we prohibit the use of data pins to get contact information. So if you use it perhaps to enhance your data so that you get, you know, someone's job title. Uh, then that's going to be okay. But if you use it in order to get their email address, uh, you know, since we require consent before mailing, then our contract says that that, that that type of data append isn't allowed anyway. And so not only is there a GDPR question to be had, but there's also just a straight contracts question that, that perhaps needs to be answered as well. Correct. Yeah. Great. Well, first, um, let me just thank uh, both Julian and Mickey um, for the both very insightful, very interesting, very complete uh, coverage of this topic, even though there is so much more to, to, to be discussed. And um, for anyone here who is looking for uh, this uh, recording and the materials, they will be available on the Insight website, um, certainly uh, before tomorrow. And uh, Again, thank you all. And if you have any questions or need to reach out to us, uh, we're happy uh, to uh, hear what you have to say and hopefully uh, answer your questions. So thank you.